My name is uh, Liam Sinclair and I'm uh, giving a brief presentation on uh, mineral nutrition of dairy cows uh, and the impact that it can have on health and performance. Uh, perhaps one of the difficult aspects of minerals is that unlike energy or protein or fibre, uh, there are 22 minerals that are of uh, importance in dairy cow health and fertility and uh, that makes it quite difficult uh, in terms of balancing them. And then they start to do uh, unusual things such as interact with each other so that one can prevent another from being absorbed, which makes it even more complicated. Some minerals are present in the diet in grams per kilogram and some are present in milligrams per kilogram, but that really has no particular bearing on how important they are to the cow. They're just as important even if they need to be included at 0.2 milligrams per kilogram or uh, 8 grams per kilogram. It's what they actually do within the cow that is important. We were wanted to determine what level of minerals cows uh, were actually receiving and what farmers were supplementing. And we did a study that was funded by Dairy Co where we went out onto 50 commercial dairy farms and we sampled the TMR that the cows were being fed. Uh, we sampled the concentrates, we took water samples, we looked at what other supplements were being fed and calculated how much was in the total diet. And then we compared that against um, uh, standard values and recommended values. And what we found was that uh, across a range of minerals uh, there was over supplementation, almost without exception. Uh, this is the uh, 100 represents the recommended level and we can see for these various minerals here how much they vary. Some farms were obviously considerably more than this, a few farms were under but not very many and in the majority of cases they were being over supplemented. Some minerals such as phosphorus, uh, the issue is it relates to the cost of the diet because phosphorus is, can be a, a comparatively expensive component but also negative effects of phosphorus if it gets into water courses and eutrophication. So feeding excess amounts uh, uh, can cause a negative effect on the environment as well as, as the financial aspects. And they did a study at, uh, at Hillsborough in Northern Ireland where they were looking at feeding basically uh, the average level, which, what we, which is what we found, or at the recommended level. And they did a four-year study and they were looking at aspects of intake, etc. And what they found <coughs> was that there was no negative effect from feeding the recommended level. And the farmer perception is often that you need to feed more, but they found that feeding the recommended level, cows ate the same, produced the same amount of milk, uh, had the same level of fertility, same bone strength. So there's no reason to do that. They then went back to the feed industry to try and reduce the levels to ensure that the Irish dairy industry uh, reduced its input from phosphorus and therefore reduced its potential environmental impact. And that's important as well because for some farms under NBZs they can have limitations of how much phosphorus they can apply onto the land. So avoiding how much is being fed can uh, uh, assist in that particular aspect of, uh, of environmental management. One mineral that we were particularly interested in uh, was copper because copper has got a, a double edge to it. Unlike some other minerals, uh, if you feed too much copper you can have an issue with toxicity and if you feed too little copper then you can have issues with uh, deficiency. Um, copper uh, toxicity is of uh, particular importance because uh, the, the greatest number of cases presented to veterinary uh, centres on mineral uh, toxicity is copper. And what happens when you feed extra copper is that the copper ends up being stored within the liver and liver levels increase until it gets to a certain level where the liver can store no more and it's released into the blood and effectively the cow goes down and dies. When farms have presented cows that have had copper toxicity and they've then investigated to see where has that toxicity come from, one of the most uh, uh, concerning aspects was that nobody on the farm really knew how much was being fed. The nutritionist knew a certain amount, the farmer was adding some, perhaps the herdsman was doing something, maybe some free axis minerals, some boluses uh, in the feed, etc., in the concentrates, but nobody re really knew. So one of the take home messages is with minerals, particularly copper, know what's in the diet and one person is responsible. But Apart from the toxicity aspects, copper is also the most highly reported cases of deficiency of minerals within the UK. So feeding too little is important as well. And feeding too little can be due to too uh, insufficient amounts within the diet, although for most farms that doesn't tend to be a problem. What tends to be the problem in deficiency is 
where you, the copper is being bound up by other minerals, particularly molybdenum and sulfur, but sometimes uh, iron can have an, an influence as well. If an animal has got copper deficiency in an extreme situation, then you can get the characteristic symptoms of animals with uh, spectacles and a, and a slight browning of the coat, but there is no real easy way of determining the copper status of the animal. You can take uh, blood samples to look at blood copper levels, but they're not a particularly sensitive means of doing that. You can look at liver biopsy samples, which is a bit more invasive, but that's quite a good way of telling you whether the cow has got too little or too much copper. Or you can look at, at uh, liver uh, samples from cows that have been presented at slaughter, because that can tell you whether they're sufficient or not. But perhaps one of the most important starting points is to determine if you're feeding too much in the diet is to analyse how much you're feeding in the diet, particularly on your forage analysis, and to look to see what the basal levels of minerals are and therefore how much you need to supplement. And a mineral analysis is relatively simple and inexpensive, but it can provide a very good starting point to determine whether you need to feed higher levels or whether lower levels are, are justified and will affect uh, performance. So my second message would be that you should feed uh, that you should be looking at uh, your forage analysis as a starting point and then considering how much minerals you need to feed um, after that. Um, we did a study for Dairy Co last winter where we wanted specifically to look at some of these antagonists, these uh, compounds that bind up copper, and we were particularly interested in whether the basal forage has an effect. And we fed a grass silage based diet and then we added these antagonists, molybdenum and sulfur, at levels way above what farmers would normally include. When we did our survey work, we found out that some farms did have high levels of molybdenum and sulfur, but they were actually feeding the lowest levels of copper. And other farms which had got higher level, had got lower levels of molybdenum, were feeding the highest levels of copper. So there was a, a, an uncertainty and, and lack of, of knowledge on how much should be fed. But in this one we fed particularly high levels, much higher than what we, we encountered on, on the survey. And on the grass silage based diet, what that did was to reduce the intake, reduce milk yield, and cause a very dramatic decrease in terms of uh, liver copper levels. But perhaps the surprising aspect was that we didn't find that on cows that were fed the May silage based ration. They continued to eat the same, they continued to produce the same, their liver copper levels decreased, but by a much uh, slower rate. So the basal forage is important. The other point I want to make from this is that this diet here was fed considerably lower copper than the UK national average. And despite being fed considerably lower levels, they were still in positive copper balance. In other words, feeding below, uh, considerably below what the average is will not result in copper deficiency. They're still in positive copper balance. And finally, <coughs> we wanted to look at aspects of whether um, uh, the form of the mineral was important. And there's a lot of products that are based on what's called chelated minerals, minerals that are bound in either proteins or to amino acids or to sugars. And a lot of companies market these in the belief that they're more similar to the natural form of the protein. And that can improve the absorption and can improve performance. We did a study looking at one form of zinc which was fed in either an inorganic form, zinc oxide, or a protonate, uh, the organic form, and we fed it at either the recommended level, which is what that 63 refers to, uh, which is still considerably lower than what the UK average was, or we fed at the lower level. And what we found in this study was that when we fed the organic at the recommended level, this treatment here, they gave about 2.4 kilograms of milk more, and that when we fed the low level of minerals, they had higher cell counts. So feeding the organic form in this study was beneficial in terms of milk yield, but feeding too low a level, I've been speaking about feeding excess, but equally if you feed too low uh, zinc, then you, they, you can get negative effects in cell count. The caveat that I would put on that is that this was one product uh, for one mineral. There are various different forms of zinc that you can have, various different products. And then you can look at copper, and you look at cobalt, you can look at a whole variety of other minerals in there. So if you're looking at buying collated minerals, organically complex minerals, establish from who's selling it what evidence they have, whether it works and whether it is effective, because they are more expensive, and you need to be reassured that you're buying the product based on evidence rather than on market. 
Okay, thank you very much.